Well, hi and great to see you all. So, mathematics, she's often called the queen of science. So many of our deep and important scientific discoveries have been found via mathematics, but are also expressed in terms of mathematics, and even some people even think that it is mathematics. So we've got insights and knowledge, and of course technology, and yet some people see her as an ice queen, sort of dealing with the cold, harsh truths of reality, and rational and objective. And these traits are seen to be at a distance and distinct to what makes us human, our subjectivity and our emotions. And I disagree with this view, <laughs> as you might uh, suspect, being a mathematician. I think that it's actually quite different. Mathematics, our queen here, is with us and in us, and even part of our emotions. And that's what I'd like to show you today. So, to start off with, let's think about what we're doing right now. I'm talking, and you're hopefully listening, and so my voice is coming via sound waves to your ears, at which point you do something. You take the sound waves, and you transform them into frequencies, and then you further process them into the sense, the experience of sound, and then language, and then understanding. But at that very first step, where you take the sound waves and transform them into frequencies, what you're doing is something mathematical. It's the uh, Fourier transform that you're conducting <laughs> right here in your body's nervous system. So this queen of ours, she's not distant from us, she's with us. But you could say, okay, that's just our bodies, our hardware. It's not really our software or our, our soul. So what about, um, what about our emotions and the connection to, to mathematics? So let's look at that. So to do that, let's have a small experiment. So how do you feel when I show you this? And you know, you might sort of say, uh, you, you might recoil with, with uh, traumatic memories of humiliation and failure, and uh, possibly long hours of boredom when you had maths in school. And, uh, or you might, like me, say, yay, mathematics, because you've had lots of fun and excitement, discovery, and of course, success uh, via mathematics. So my point here is that mathematics certainly does induce emotions in us, even strong emotions. They could be negative or positive, even just boredom, <laughs> but boredom itself is also an emotion. So that's not to say that emotions are inherently uh, mathematical, but it does say that there's some sort of connection and that we're close to mathematics at, a, at an emotional level. So let's go one step further and see how you know, mathematics is actually part of our emotions. And to do that, let's look at individual emotions. So the first one is depression. So there's a lot of research in very recent years about modeling depression via mathematical models, often using Markov chains. These are mathematical object, uh, objects that are very good at modeling things. And in this particular case, they model various states of depression and more in particularly, sort of make a map of depression, how we can get from one state to another and so forth. And this lets us understand depression far better than we used to. And it might even lead to some treatment uh, where we can, uh, so to speak, find uh, maps and guides to help people navigate their way out of the maze of depressive states. And even better, now that we understand this emotion, this depression better, we're beginning to understand that it might actually serve a purpose and might even be in some ways mathematical. So what I mean by that, and I should be careful here, <laughs> uh, some sorts of depression, the low level types of depression, might actually be helpful and useful and in the, certain, in the following way. So if you suddenly find your life going off the tracks and there might be some big problem that you have to deal with, then you have these low level forms of depression that might say, time out, put everything on hold, let's focus on this one problem. And then we can use our analytical skills, our problem solving skills to try to solve this problem. It's not pleasant, but it's useful. And possibly there isn't a solution and then you might have to try to find a solution to coming to terms with this situation, either via loss or mourning or grief or so forth, but definitely some analytical problem solving, some useful skills are going on in this useful, apparently, uh, emotion. So this emotion is uh, easily described, at least we can find that we can uh, describe it more and more in terms of mathematics, and we even see that it has mathematical traits. And the same is true for empathy and compassion and these emotions. So here we've actually done a little bit too well in describing it. We have several models that describe empathy and uh, compassion and so forth quite well. And uh, unfortunately, they conflict a little bit. <laughs> so we've had success, but uh, there's much more to learn in this space. And one of the reasons that there is this conflict is that we understand empathy and compassion in terms of genetics and genetic evolution. So we sort of are be beginning to understand DNA 
uh, that's sort of like the building blocks of our body, the hardware, so to speak. But there's a revolution in evolution, if you want, uh, that we've discovered the software. That's called epigenetics, and we've just discovered it a decade or two ago and barely scratched the surface of this massive field of knowledge. And that has flow-on effects like also understanding, for instance, empathy and compassion. So let's go to another motion, uh, motion that we all love, I hope, uh, love. And uh, this is also different from empathy and depression in that we've looked at this uh, motion from a mathematical perspective for a long time. It's sort of well understood. And you might react, how, you know, this is a motion, an emotion that's core to who we are, at least that's how we see it. How could this on earth be related to mathematics? But no, this uh, well-established research has already shown that there are many ma mathematical patterns and even strategies for dealing with sex and love and relationships and so forth. And I, I consider, <coughs> sorry, I recommend you to look at uh, the works here. There are books written about it, uh, The Mathematics of Love and Sex by researchers in the field, for instance, Hannah Fry and Cleo Criswell, who have also given really good talks. Check them out, and um, so that's fairly well established. Now, if we look at something, uh, some emotion that's a lot less well established or less looked at, uh, we have humor. And I love that uh, emotion personally, that's one of my favorites. But uh, for thousands of years, philosophers have talked back and forward, what is humor and what is it, what is it good for? And uh, 200 years ago exactly, the eminent philosopher Schopenhauer, he said, well, it could be our reaction to the unexpected, to surprise. Or more particularly, if we, want to get, if we want to be precise about it, he said, well, it's our reaction to when our expectations don't get met, when something else happens. So that's an important subtlety. Now, of course, philosophers, they can talk back and forwards for ages, for centuries, millennia even, and never quite get to some conclusion. But we can do better. And actually, we've got the tools just now, just within the last couple of years, five years, 10 years, mathematical tools to actually solve these deep and fundamental philosophical questions. And that's, I, f I find this fascinating, this, it's really cool. So in the case of humor, we actually have a very precise and sort of surprising uh, result. And that was given by this, uh, this study here, uh, where, <laughs> and the title always cracks me up, telling the world's least funny jokes. I mean, that <laughs> my humor is a bit simple, but yeah. Uh, but um, in this study here, participants were given these random nonsense words, and they had to rate them. How funny do you think these words are? And at the same time, the researchers took these words and they measured them uh, for how random they were. So you can do that via this, uh, this function here, this entropy function. That's a mathematical function that measures how much information is there in a, in a system, how much uh, randomness is there in a system. Well, as it turns out, there's a very strong correlation between how funny the words were and how random the words were. So we know, we know the answer. We know what humor is now, at least a great component of it. Schopenhauer was right. It's our reaction to the unexpected. And more precisely, we know a little bit better now. Uh, we can measure, we can calculate, and that's what we're doing when we're using humor, how unexpected something is, how random it is. And you can see that this is a useful function. Like we love stability and security, reliability, but Life doesn't always go that way that we expect, so humor is a lovely way of dealing with the unexpected surprise in a, in a positive way, so that we don't get anxious or worried or stressed. We, we're, unhap we're happy instead, we laugh. So, so you know, it's, it's beautiful that we can understand humor, and from my perspective, it's great that we can use mathematics to find out the answers to these age-old questions, but we even find out that the emotion itself is inherently mathematical, which, uh, which came as a surprise to me. In a similar vein, we have uh, beauty, and this is a fascinating one. Uh, what I mean here is the sense of beauty, the joy and uh, delight in uh, perceiving beauty, and that could be like a beautiful face, or uh, some nature, or art, or music, or even uh, some, some sense of fairness, or, or for instance, mathematics. And of course, philosophers, artists, musicians, uh, and poets have discussed what beauty is, as this sort of platonic, platonic ideal, and also sort of a, at a more mundane level, uh, you know, is this thing beautiful? Is that thing beautiful? How, how do we make beautiful art and so forth? But uh, what they really should have been asking is, why do we sense th uh, things? Why do we think, uh, see things as beautiful? I mean, what, what, uh, why do we have this emotion? What function does it serve? What purpose? And what does it consist of? And 
Again, just like with humor, we can actually answer these, these deep and fundamental questions in the case of beauty. And I find this really fascinating and itself beautiful. I'll tell you the answer actually right now. It comes in two components or two parts. One is the beauty in mathematics and then there's the beauty in general. So I'll first tell you about beauty in mathematics. And being a mathematician, this is quite personal. I look at some, uh, I look at some mathematics and uh, if I find it beautiful, as I often do when I'm doing mathematical research or just for fun, then if you ver look very closely at what's, what's happening when I see this beautiful mathematics, there are two things going on. One is that I'm recognizing patter, patterns and symmetry and order or explanations. Uh, so what I'm doing there is I'm using pattern solving and problem, uh, problem, sorry, pattern recognition and problem solving. And my brain really loves me for doing that. So it rewards me with happy chemicals, happy drugs, uh, dopamine in particular. So what I'm doing, I'm looking at this mathematics, I get rewarded with these happy drugs and oh, this is beautiful. So the other component of it is what we've seen before, randomness, humor. So I might be doing some mathematical research and I'll discover something which I never would have expected. And that really makes me happy, delighted, excited, but also it makes me laugh even. Uh, and you would be surprised to see, <laughs> you might be surprised at least, to see how much laughter is going on in mathematical research. <laughs> that, uh, um, so again, we have this uh, very strictly mathematical, uh, well not strictly, but this inherently mathematical property of an emotion in this sense, the sense of beauty, and of course the pattern recognition and the problem solving component is also extremely mathematical. So we sort of understand what's going on in the sense of beauty in mathematics, but what about more generally? And there I can tell you the answer too, and that's a, it's a really elegant study that's uh, been conducted just a couple of years ago by a group of researchers, con uh, including the eminent Sir uh, Michael Attia. And uh, what they did to these poor participants uh, was uh, give them some uh, things to listen to and look at, like art and uh, music, and also mathematics, and then they took the participants and they scanned their brains. <laughs> and the participants had to rate what they were experiencing in, uh, on a scale of, do you think it's beautiful or not? Uh, and it turned out that when people saw something beautiful or heard something beautiful, their brains lit up in exactly the same ways, in exactly the same areas as well. So regardless of what format of beauty they saw, so whether it was art or music or mathematics, their brains reacted in the same way so if we understand how it works in one way, then we understand how it works in the other ways, presumably. And we do. I've just told you how it works for mathematics, so let's uh, assume that it works the same way for art and music and all the other senses of beauty that we might have. And think about it. So if we see something that's beautiful, there was the pattern recognition, there was the symmetry and order of things, and then there's the randomness factor, the surprise. So if I see some beautiful face, then uh, uh, faces that are more symmetrical than not tend to be more beautiful to us than not. So we've got the symmetry there. But also, it's a little bit bland if you don't also mix it up with something that breaks the symmetry just a little bit in an interesting, surprising way. So there you have the randomness. So if you think about music, you know, we've got rhythm and harmony and uh, these things that we can detect, uh, detect like patterns and, uh, and uh, order and symmetries. But music would be a little bit boring if we didn't also have some little extra unexpectednesses that give it character and flavor and personality and charm. So we understand this, this uh, age-old uh, philosophical notion just in recent years, like just the last handful of years, and the tools that we're using are mathematical, but we even find out that the answers are mathematical too. And you can, and I please urge you to go on and look at all the other emotions that you can find, and a lot of research is going on in similar vein that shows us uh, what these emotions are for, what they are consisting of. A lot of deep philosoph uh, philosophical questions are being answered, but we also see that, uh, well, this queen of ours, this queen of science mathematics, she's not this distant icy queen. Uh, she's right here with us, in us, and even part of our emotions. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks.